Good morning. I'm Dr. Mark Peters from Techie Corporation. I'm here with Agile Compliance and Risk Operations, uh, talking about some of the things we've done to implement DevOps in some government contractor spaces over the past uh, year that I've been employed in those areas. Um, I have to remind everybody as I talk about government stuff that I don't actually speak for the government uh, program for which I'm employed. I'm speaking for myself and my company. Uh, these are my personal views. don't necessarily represent any of those other folks along the way. I also mentioned that I do tend to talk really fast, and I'm going to try to slow myself down and make the time limits appropriately, uh, but we'll see how it goes along the way. Uh, so as all good talks start, uh, first we have to move and hook. Lost my webcam. There we go. And there we go. So who am I? A quick introduction. Uh, I used to work in Air Force Intelligence. I spent about 22 years working for the U.S. Air Force. I went all over the world with all kinds of different things uh, to different people, telling them uh, things they didn't want to know and what the secrets were, and finding out the secrets from the opposite side of our cybersecurity, working on those opposite perspectives to get things through. Uh, needless to say, working with a government organization for that long. I got oodles of experience with compliance practices, making sure that the security was in the right place, uh, that the tools were in the right place, that things were moving from one side to the other, and that all the information got to the people they needed to do. Uh, so after enforcing those compliance practices for years and years, and being on the other side of it, I, I got into cybersecurity. Uh, and I got into that practice because I'd spent some time with the NSA, I'd worked with some of their functions, I'd worked with some of the other cyber functions, and I'd run a couple different units doing cyber things uh, back and forth along the way. At those times, I got to implement those tools at multiple levels and see how they worked all the way from building your own sets uh, and having them there and trying to figure out how the computers work to getting those results out to the ops guys so that they could use it effectively to do what they wanted to do. In the past year, that means that what I've done is I've worked with two different agile uh, programs or government programs that are enforcing uh, cyber weapon systems for the government and they're trying to build an agile transition to their programs. Uh, for one, I worked as the product owner, trying to make their pipelines and their platforms work better. And for the other, I've been the lead security engineer, so implementing security all across the way and trying to make those pieces all fit together in a manner uh, that everybody can use most effectively. Uh, I'm also a DevOps Institute ambassador. If you're curious about DevOps, the DevOps Institute is out there, and they talk about the three ways all the time. And we talk about flow, feedback, and continuous learning, so I'll mention those later in the talk as we go through. Uh, and since some of my other background, just real quick, I'm an avid reader. I read a little bit of everything. I read history. I read about DevOps. I read about business. I read about sci-fi and fantasy. Uh, so if you've got any good books, feel free to lean out and uh, recommend them. I've also done a lot of writing along the way. I, I actually published a book uh, about a year and a half ago called Cashing In on Cyber Power, where I looked at 10 years of economic attacks or 10 years of cyber attacks uh, and how they developed economic influences all across the world. Uh, I do have a doctorate in strategic security, not in arithmetic, but in those reading and writing functions as we move forward. So leaping into the talk, uh, the problem was, as we came across it, as we moved into this new role here as a lead security engineer, is how does my security team ensure compliance, enforce the standards, uh, and still remain agile? Now this remains a problem for a lot because security is seen as uh, non-flexible, as we talked about, and they look at their own things and they don't expand and they don't make this merge. But we want to be committed to the team vision and the team organization. In order to do that, we have to be agile across the process. And that starts with looking at ourselves. It doesn't start with pointing the finger at the other side of the fence. Uh, and looking at someone over there and saying, you know what, you guys are doing it wrong, uh, and you need to fix it to do it the way we do. What we want to do is we wanted to fix ourselves uh, so that we could be an example, so that we could lean into those things and provide help to those other organizations. As the cyber lead, as the cybersecurity lead in the security team, we face this problem daily. Uh, we go out to everybody, we talk to everyone, and we say, you know, what can we do? How can we help? Uh, but we weren't getting there because we were making the transition with the government program from what used to be a waterfall program to what is now said they're going to be an agile program. And in that, you still have a lot of the old practices, and you have the old ideas, and you have the old culture. Uh, and you need to move that forward. And one of those biggest challenges, as we're looking at the cyber team, is the government, that DOD, that U.S. Air Force sector, uses the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and they use something called 853, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. That 853 lists categories and controls and indicators for doing a, a risk management framework, or they call it a risk management framework, uh, because it's supposed to guide you in doing your cybersecurity. But what actually happens is you get 19 different families of controls with over a thousand different controls and indicators, uh, and the government comes back and says, hey, guess what? Uh, we've got a thousand different indicators. We'd like you to respond to every indicator uh, with artifacts and examples of what you're doing and how you're doing it uh, and, and how we move that forward. Uh, but we didn't want to go there. We didn't want to be 
that tightly tied. We didn't want to be that tightly tied when we sat down with the dev and said, hey, you know what? I need you to answer uh, about a thousand questions on how your program is going and what you're going to do next. We wanted to be in an agile process where we're talking about those four basic principles, those four guides to agile, where we're talking about people over processes. We're talking about working software over uh, comprehensive documentation. And we're talking about moving forward the whole scope of things. Uh, and we're talking about using Scrum and getting that daily feedback into something that's a, uh, a very standard process. So as we're looking at the problem about ensuring those compliance, enforcing standards, remaining agile, we start looking at the parameters. Because the parameters for us are the things we have to consider. What we have to do is we're working in that government bureaucratic framework and we've got to make sure that we can move ahead. We've got to make sure that we can move to the right places to actually accomplish those things. So we have to meet the standards that they're laying out for us. And as a contractor, we have to meet the standards that are in our contract as we move forward. We have to be able to manage risk and we have to be able to manage risk effectively because in the end, that's what security is about. It's about tying risk down to the factor where you can get into the risk and you can find the things. And then we had to look, as always, at the third option of where we could buy a solution. Who could we buy a solution from? Could we just hire somebody else to come in and replace us uh, and do the job for us at a lower cost? Uh, like the Tom Sawyer thing, where you pay everybody to paint your fence for you, uh, and then you just sit back and collect at the end. So, uh, and looking at our parameters, the first, uh, as always, like we said, is to be compliant or agile. Now, what we see is we see compliant or agile as the opposite sides of the room. There's no compromise between being compliant or being agile, and that the Places that are inflexible in their compliance don't see it any different because we see all kinds of compliance. We see the legally prescribed compliance. We see the organizationally prescribed compliance. Uh, and we see sometimes even internally prescribed compliance. What do we have to be compliant with the standard for our organization as we move forward into that setup? Now, this includes something like FIPS for the cryptographic standards, the NIST that I already talked about, uh, FISMA, SOX for, for the, the stocks and the credit exchanges, the PCI disk for your credit cards, uh, the GDPR for um, Europe, the CCPA that they've implemented in California, they're all different standards. Uh, many times a lot of them apply, many times only some of them apply, and many times uh, they're good ideas, but they're not formal practices. Uh, all these compliance standards are usually very administratively heavy. There's a lot of stuff that has to be done, uh, and they're very difficult to implement, and that they're meant to be that way so that you have experts that come in and can enforce those. There's a lack of freedom and there's a lot of blockers in those processes. But it's not true all the time. Sometimes it just takes a different way of looking at that. And I'd like to think that a lot of the way of looking at that is in those agile practices. As we look at agile, as we look at uh, lean scrum uh, and those types of frameworks that we can get to a DevOps mindset, that we can get to a better way to interact those things together and make it more of a loose framework that leads to our high level success uh, in getting the job done. We've got to eliminate that, that pull, that back and forth on those processes so that we can get to the right area and we can get to the right place where we're talking about the things that we need to do and we're talking in an effective manner about those things we need to do to move forward. Uh, so we need to be compliant and we need to be agile in the process. And being compliant and being agile gets to the same spot when you're talking about security and when you're talking about getting security into the practices so that you can deliver effectively on the value for the organization. Uh, and that means you need to talk about risk. You need to talk about risk management uh, and you need to be able to do the math without numbers. And that's a very contradictory statement because there really is no math without numbers. But at the same time, you're talking about the various elements of those processes. Uh, you're talking about the ability to talk about those three elements or those four elements that make up risk. And when you look at a risk equation or a standard risk equation, you're talking about uh, threat times vulnerability time or risk equals threat times vulnerability to exposure. Uh, and we want to lower all those elements. But in order to lower those elements, we have to be able to talk about those elements. We have to be able to talk effectively. We have to know what the threat is, who's coming at us, uh, where does it exist, and whether that threat is a, a foreign malware source or that threat is just a loss of business, right? The threat to us may be that we can't deliver uh, unless we have that product out there. Uh, the vulnerabilities are those things that exist in our system, in our code, uh, in our culture uh, that may cause exceptions, that may cause gaps in the feature, whether it's a standard, a, a CVE off the, the enterprise that says, hey, we've got a, a break in our program, we've got a break in our code, and you know what, it's going to be vulnerable and it's going to be a critical failure unless we fix that immediately. Uh, if we've got a break in our firewall, if we've got uh, all kinds of other vulnerabilities. But that also leads to exposure. And the reason I say it leads to is exposure is in managing risk, exposure is one of those key things, especially in working with government programs, right? That you have to be able to talk about effective exposure. but if you've only got 
a small area, and that small area is off-prem, and it's behind the number of firewalls, and it only reaches out through one way, and it only reaches through a VPN, that handing a, handling a uh, exposure on that back-end system uh, may be relatively minimal. It may only cause you relatively minimal risk, even if some other site, like a CVE or MITRE, says it's a critical failure, because it's so far behind that that there's no exposure uh, to that system that you see. So you have to manage all those risks, and you have to compare between those risks to be able to manage the structure in a way that you can effectively present those results uh, as you're sitting down and talking to devs and talking about your ability to do your risk operations and your agile compliance. Uh, and that's what we did. We said we wanted to be agile compliant, but we still wanted to manage risk, and we wanted to manage risk through operations. And to us, our agile compliance meant that we may need to maintain that compliance without sacrificing flexibility. I think earlier in one of the presentations, they talked about the inflexible developers. Uh, well, a lot of times security hits that same inflexibility as well. That we need to be more flexible. Uh, and not all of our guys, they were kind of rooted in the process. They're not all good at doing merger and moving some of those transitions. Uh, so the flexibility was in between. But we did that agile compliance. So we worked to get to that agile compliance. Uh, and we worked to that at the same time through doing risk operations, managing our risk, and always talking about risk in the same manner, uh, and being able to talk about how we were effective in that risk or where that risk could structure uh, as we move forward. So the third option, like I mentioned for us, was that uh, buying a solution. Uh, and everybody knows that you can go out there and buy a solution. There's lots of contractors all over the place. Uh, if you've been in cybersecurity for any length of time, I'm sure at least uh, a third of your emails, if not more coming in are from vendors. Uh, and they offer a lot of good products. And there's a lot of good things out there uh, nowadays that you can get in these product scapes uh, that'll help you and they'll help move your process forward and they'll make you more effective and they'll deliver value to your process from the beginning to the end. Uh, so they fall into kind of different scopes. And the first scope is really a, who wants to sell method? Uh, and you get the scaled agile framework for enterprise. It used to be scaled agile for enterprise. Now it's a scaled agile framework uh, for enterprise. And the government is using that. They're using it a lot. Uh, and they've bought this big framework that goes in and it gives them a structure that they can use when they start talking about implementing agile uh, and implementing a DevOps mindset to move forward. Uh, but it does cost, and it costs to get trained people, and it costs to get the trained experience uh, and to bring them in. And the next step, you get Disciplined Agile. Right? Disciplined Agile is from the PMI Institute. Uh, and I'm a, a program management professional, so you know, full disclosure there. I've seen Disciplined Agile, and it's a way of, again, taking that Agile mindset and building it onto a structure so that when a big company like the government comes in and says, hey, you know what, uh, I need something, and I need a framework, but I'm not ready to give up all my culture to get to that framework, to get to that agile compliance, uh, it, it kind of kind of help them along the process. Uh, then you see Deloitte and other companies who will come in uh, and they'll bring a consultant in. The consultant will tell you everything you're doing wrong and everything you're doing right, uh, with more emphasis on what you're doing wrong, and tie you in for a long-term contract uh, that'll get you in the process, that'll get you to agile compliance, that'll get you to risk operations all along the way uh, so that you can do the right things uh, and make success and have value in your organization. You get overlays. ITEL and CMMI are both great organizations and they both, both offer good quality products, uh, but it's still buying someone else's overlay and depending that they're answering the right questions for your organization to move forward. And, and a mix of these is helpful and understanding all of these is helpful. Uh, and you see SRE certifications and working with the DevOps Institute, that site reliability engineer, those are good functions and those are good effective functions uh, that help people do good things. Uh, and they build in value throughout your organization by having that development from ops all the way through security, all the way into dev. Uh, but you have to be able to understand them. You have to talk about them. And sometimes that's working through the process first and getting to the first steps uh, before you find out that you need an actual SRE certification. Or you actually need one of these overlays from somebody else. Uh, and then you see people who are just selling experts, right? I'm not going to give you an overlay. Instead, I'll give you an expert. I'll sell you an expert. That expert can go into your organization and when they get to your organization, they're going to help you fix everything that's wrong with you. Uh, you see this from a lot of staffing agencies. You also see it from government contractors, which I can't complain too much because we've come in as a government contractor. Although I do have to mention, uh, in all fairness, as we talk about our government contracting situation, we took over from a previous set of contracts. Uh, the previous set of contracts for the weapon program we're doing, the Cyber Vulnerability Analysis Weapon Program, uh, had three different contracts with three different companies. And they had one contract doing maintenance, one contract doing sustainment, and one contract doing development. Well, when uh, our company, Technica Corporation, came in, we took over all three of those contracts and blended them together, uh, which is working for us so far so good, uh, as we'll mention in some of the other slides, but better than the previous three, uh, where none of those contracts were willing to talk to each other to get the maintenance and sustainment development all done 
uh, in conjunction in time to get to something where they could actually have an agile compliance uh, and a risk operation along the way. So how do we discover fixes? How do we get there? With these problems in this framework around what we need to do, uh, how do we find out what it is that we need to fix, where we need to fix it, and find an effective way to move us forward uh, in what it is. And the first thing is adoptive philosophy, right? It always boils down with Agile and DevOps uh, in SRE that you have to have an effective culture. And that means you need to start both small for the culture from the bottom up, as well as from the top down. Both sides have a culture and you have to meet those cultures in. Uh, with our security team, when we sat down to adopt the philosophy, I came in from an outside program and the previous three individuals on our security team were already there. Uh, so they already kind of had a philosophy from that organization, from their previous waterfall setup. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to move it into that, uh, that kind of DevOps agile mindset. Uh, and that meant who are we serving? Where are we building value? Where are we delivering uh, effectiveness into the organization uh, through this value philosophy? through this DevOps and the value stream that goes with the DevOps as we move forward. Um, we talked about first that we have security user stores. Who uses security, right? Who needs to use our security products? Who needs to use those security features? And the first thought is, well, the devs are the users, right? Because they actually have to get the security. We have to convince them to build the security. And we have to convince them to put the security both in their products and in their pipelines uh, and in their deliverables. So, so, so they're part of the, the user uh, that are using our storage when we say we need this to be effective. Because in the government, in a bureaucracy, in a compliance, uh, if we don't do all those things that we need for compliance, uh, and an outside organization comes in and says, hey, you know what, you're not compliant, uh, they can shut us down and they can pull it back. And that's not good for anybody. Uh, most of all the devs, because there's a lot of them, and because they put a lot of hard work in to trying to get the process forward and trying to make it work on a daily basis. So what do we see about the devs? Well, the devs also have their user stories, right? It, they see security as an enabler. So we have to work through that mindset that we enable them to do more effective things uh, when we give them good security. We allow them to deliver more value uh, all across the way uh, with those effective things. And how do we get them to talk to us on a regular basis? How do we integrate with them on a regular basis? Uh, and that has to be part of our mindset too. That security historically in a waterfall uh, sometimes has a bad reputation or a bad experience of constantly being no, of being the culture of no, that we only say no uh, because we're just trying to get compliant. Uh, but we're not really just trying to get compliant. We're trying to do the things that are value for us that our organization has told us value. But we need to integrate to get past that process uh, to get into the place where we can do the good things for everyone. Uh, and then we have a product owner story, right? The person who owns the business, the customer who's getting that end goal value uh, from the entire stream. Uh, and that has to be that compliance adds value. That we have to be compliant to add value and they have to value that the new things of compliance and the new security and that agile compliance that comes in through that security is just as valuable uh, as putting in a new feature. And that new feature loses value if you don't have the security and the compliance built in all the way across the process to get you what you need. And we started to do that when we were thinking about it, by how do we manage risk? How do we operate through risk? Instead of just saying we're managing, we want to talk about risk operations because we want to talk about this change and cycle uh, and this process that goes through to be able to effectively talk through our risk processes uh, with a number of different people and a number of different factors. So we have to be able to manage multiple users. We have to be able to manage multiple users all the time. In order to manage those users, we have to be familiar with those users. Part of that is integrating into those teams uh, and making sure that we had security reps in those teams. A lot of times they'll tell you about security champions and using a security champion and designating someone to represent security for your team. Uh, and that may work as you get larger and larger, but when you have small teams and only a certain number of dev teams, uh, I think it works better to get your security team in there every day. Uh, get the experience and get the face-to-face. -face. Uh, and we need to be able to suggest those solutions in those face-to-face -face experiences by uh, talking without leveraging, right? We can't say, this is what you have to do, and if you don't do it, we're going to shut you down. We're going to cut it down right here. Instead, we have to listen to what the developers are putting forward, uh, what they need to do, and suggest how they can find ways to make that go through compliance and how they can make that compliant uh, in the process. Uh, and hopefully that gives us some long-term success with the short-term compliance and that having an effective process and having effective people that are integrated and they're talking to del deliver functional software helps us meet the compliance all the way through so that we can do these easy things in small steps and then use automation to round those up together so that we can meet those compliance standards at the far ends uh, with our thousands and thousands of controls.
so what was our security team problems and what were some of the solutions along the way? Uh, so with a new contract, the first question was, where do I start, right? What occurred before? Uh, we came in, we came into this new government space. Uh, in working in the government space, our first problem was access. A lot of these government programs are uh, blocked when you see that uh, you have to get access to the government. The government wants certain things to be filled out before you get into those spaces. And you have to have the paperwork. And you have to have what's done. I always say, and I always work in that uh, when you work with programs, when you work with software, when you work with any process really, in any type of operation, uh, change creates error, but indecision creates disaster. You have to be able to make the small uh, changes along the way to do things. You have to make small decisions in small increments. And without the access at first, without the access to the old compliance standards, that was what we did. We went back to the basic security practices. We went back to the basics of um, what was happening, how was it happening, were we making sure that we were doing the right things? Did we have all the users integrated? Did we have all the users' uh, passwords good? Did we have the secrets protected? Did we have um, our facilities not just locked down, but locked out in certain ways uh, that we can make the standards? Um, so we were making these small decisions in these small increments along the way. Uh, and then the next step for us was, do we understand the tools at hand? Do we have the right tools in the places the government came in uh, and processed it to us that we were able to do the right things and that we saw them as effective uh, in the process? So we had to challenge the old models because the old model was waterfall uh, and the waterfall development of being able to deliver in five years uh, was no longer effective. So we had to look at the new tools so that we could get new cycles out. We could test the new tools. We looked at things like DI2E, which is a framework of developer defense intelligence um, in integration to enterprise, uh, Trello, which is the boards for workflow, uh, Clara, which is a container scanner, SonarCube, which is a code scanner, a, a, a SaaS tool, a static analysis security tool, and SaltStack is an integration management. Uh, we were finding ways to integrate those. We were finding ways, uh, we even used, uh, we shifted from a Jenkins to a GitLab in the earlier formats uh, so that we could get more pipeline built in and more of that CI, CD framework uh, built in along the process. But some of that was learning for us. Some of that was learning that the security team had to go back and challenge their previous assumptions uh, and sit down with the devs and say, uh, this is what it is and this is what we're doing and this is how we use it. Uh, and I can even mention with GitLab that GitLab is a great tool and we love using GitLab. But uh, one of our first debates with the guys over GitLab was that they said, hey, we're going to GitLab. We said, that's great. Uh, when you move from Jenkins and you're moving out to GitLab, GitLab has these great security dashboards. We want to see those security dashboards. We want to be able to get those metrics uh, and look at you and use those metrics, right? Because those metrics are great. Those metrics will give us so much of the security compliance information that we can automate and we don't have to go bug you all the time for this information. Uh, and the devs came back and said, yeah, that's nice, but we only bought the bronze package and the bronze package doesn't include the security dashboard. So you're gonna have to wait till next time. Uh, so instead we have to plug them and we're still working through our process uh, for that. But hopefully we'll be able to get some more success with it uh, along the way. And at least we've got our pipeline metrics. And with that pipeline, uh, we've got the tools in the process, right? So uh, talking through how you get to that agile compliance, if you can go through to that compliance guy and you can say, hey, uh, in that compliance with the tools I've got, I get every time code gets checked in, I get a number of scans, I get a number of processes. I get that, uh, that static code analysis at the beginning, and at the end, I get that dynamic analysis of how it goes into the platform, and I get the scan of everything that's matching up, as well as I get uh, a STIG, which is a government framework for a secure technical implementation guidance. It tells you all the things you need to do with every tool uh, to make sure it's compliant. Uh, so you use the STIGs. Did you apply all the STIGs effectively? And we can go and say, hey, not only is this being done because you came and audit, but we're doing this for ourselves and we're doing it every day. Uh, and I've got this whole stack of data so that when the auditor comes in, uh, I can say, I've already got it for you, right? It's already there uh, and it's what we have. And that blends into that next part of, be, can you see what you need to do? Are you able to work transparently and communicate often? Uh, again, we see security a lot of times, a lot of old security practices. And what happens is that security comes back behind a, a blocker behind the wall. Nobody wants to talk about the security. Nobody wants to talk about the vulnerabilities. Nobody wants to talk about uh, what's wrong. We don't see it as wrong, but it is potential for fix. It is potential to improve and to do better. 
by being able to work transparently. We have to be transparent about what we're looking for just as much as we need them to be transparent about what they're working on and what the factors of them actually working uh, with that process are. And that's part of that communication often. How do we get to a process where we communicate often enough uh, that we get what we need and not only that, but the developers get what they need, that we're involved and embedded in those teams. Uh, and, and right now we do. Uh, we have somebody in one of their teams every day. We have four, uh, three development teams and an engineering and architecture team. Uh, and with four security guys, we have one person on each of those teams uh, every day sitting in their scrums, offering them advice uh, when they need it, because a lot of times they don't need it. A lot of times they can do their own thing. But then taking that information back and building a consolidated security picture of how everything works uh, along the way. So this leads to the next step, which is it's not just about us, right? It's not just about my security team. It's not just about that development team or this ops team or that function on the wear. We have to have an organizational solution. Uh, we have to be able to make the culture change both from the top up and the bottom, bottom up and the top down uh, to deliver a, a process where we can build those good teams. Uh, and we need to be able to work through those uh, through that leadership structure all along the way. Uh, and that's a challenge, and it's a challenge for a lot of people. Uh, but if you invest in the people and, and you harvest that process, you harvest the good things that come out of the people because it's people over processes. But you have to have the right people, and having the right people build processes along the way. You have to take the people first and know that the developer is important and that that person is important, and that lets you get to the point where you have a good process uh, by working through there and building a team that depends not just on their own team, but that every other team is functioning along the same way. So we talk about being able to integrate, and we talk about being able to uh, beat the street, right? Now, I say beat the street because I had a, a good senior leader come back to me one time. He mentioned that uh, somebody asked him why he repeated the same thing over and over when he did talks. They said they'd seen him talk in three or four different places, and he said the same thing every time. And he said the same three things every time. Uh, and his response when he came back was that 10% uh, of the people who hear me, hear 10% of what I say 10% of the time. He said he figured if that happened, he had to say the same thing 30 times before he could effectively depend on one person hearing him once. Uh, and the same thing applies to security, and the same thing applies to development. When we go through and we want to talk about security, we need to say the same thing, and we need to be on the same message. If we're constantly changing our security message, and we're constantly changing how that security message is going to affect value, uh, then we can't manage our risk, and we can't be agilely compliant because Somebody will hear a different thing every time we get there. And they've got a lot of stuff to do, uh, just like we do. Uh, the devs have a lot of things that they need to take care of. So if they only hear part of the message part of the time, uh, then we don't get to an effective security platform along the way. And that translates into building transparency as well. Having that transparency all along the way, being able to visualize workflow and being able to go and see what everyone is doing uh, keeps you from having to track that person down and say, hey, I need you to tell me. Uh, because you can see it for yourself and you can see it from the beginning to the end of the process across the pipeline. Uh, and that's a lot of what that flow and feedback is in that DevOps model, being able to have a clear flow and get clear feedback all across the step. And that's what we're working towards with this agile compliance and this risk operations. Uh, and then we need to be able to link items and tasks. Uh, you have to be able to take the item and when you see it, know how security fits in and know that security is part of it all the time, just like the operation of it is part of it. Having those acceptance criteria and those uh, definitions of done built in across the way uh, that lets you get where you need to be by linking those items together. Uh, and having a backlog of what you need to get to. Sometimes security is not the most important priority. Uh, I know that's sacrilege to a lot of people on the security teams. And I know that's sacrilege to a lot of the people who worked it. But sometimes because of that exposure, because of that risk management, you can put security in the backlog. And it can come up the next time or the time after that or the time after that. It has to be done before compliance, but what is your compliance framework? When is somebody else going to check? And what is your risk if you actually let that security go and say, hey, you know what? We have a CICD. I'm going to fix it the next time because it's more important to get that feature out now. Uh, and that leads to the prioritization. How do we prioritize those things along the way for security? So once we have the organizational solutions, what are those takeaways? What are the things we learned from doing this uh, all along the way uh, as we're moving our process forward? Uh, and, and the first is practice, 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 right? Uh, agile is a skill. Agile compliance is a skill. Security is a skill. Coding is a skill. Uh, there's a great paper by a gentleman named Malcolm Gladwell who's written, written a lot of stuff on the process. 
uh, may actually be a book called Outliers that was written in the 90s. And one of the things he talks about was the number of times you have to achieve deliberate practice to be considered good at something. Uh, and those numbers wind up looking like 500 times, but you have to be able to repeat it 500 times for familiarity, about 5,000 times for some basic level of competence, and about 50,000 times for mastery. And it has to be deliberate practice, which means you have to concentrate on those right things that you're doing uh, to be able to uh, move forward. Uh, and it's difficult. If you think about doing a sprint, if you think about doing your, your basic scrum meeting that you do uh, every day, and you spend 15 minutes doing every day, and you probably do it 280 times a year, uh, if that, uh, and if you need to be able to do that 50,000 times before you can see so you're effective at that, you really have to practice. You have to take advantage of every opportunity uh, as an opportunity to practice, and an opportunity to get that continuous learning from that third way uh, and move it forward. Uh, so we practice, and we practice a lot. We try to talk about what we practice, and we practice through our scrums, and we practice through our retros, and we practice through our, our reviews of what we're doing so that we can find a way to get to the agile compliance uh, and this risk operations. Uh, and then we say, through that, as we're learning, we never stop learning. We never stop learning about how we manage our backlog, how we prioritize, and why it's important to prioritize. And that's the integration of people. Uh, that's the communication along the way, that agile communication that you have to get there uh, and value those people over the processes. You have to value change over a plan. Uh, compliance is a plan. I mean, it tells you to do one thing. But we want to value the change. So how do we change to meet the compliance, uh, to manage our risk, and be able to prioritize? And through that, we take the time to innovate uh, and adapt our processes uh, so that they fit better the next time and they fit better into the things that we're trying to do uh, as we move forward. And I can't see. Ah, there we go. Uh, and the last one is we have to advocate. I've talked about advocating being able to beat the street. You have to constantly go out there and convince others. If we're not doing it ourselves, if we're not enthusiastic and passionate about the process of our security, uh, then we're not going to be able to convince other people, right? Because everybody's passionate about their own thing. They're passionate about what they're doing. Uh, and it's building that passion into a broader view that we're passionate not just about our thing, but we're passionate about delivering value to the organization. Uh, we deliver that value through convincing others that compliance is a good thing, that getting to this agile compliance, that it's not going to slow them down, that security is not going to break them, but it's going to move them forward to the right pieces uh, that they need to deliver success uh, all along the way. Uh, and with that, we have to build relationships over processes. I mean, that's Agile 1. In building those relationships takes time. In building those relationships in a secure manner takes time uh, so that they trust us as experts, that they trust that we're coming to them with the right things, that we're coming to them with the right notes. Uh, and as we have those notes, we're moving forward and doing our things. Uh, and sometimes that means doing the compliance stuff behind the work, right? Uh, they want to talk about having a demo. They want to talk about having... Uh, what the next functional software delivery is, and all you've done is address how they've done in the controls. But when you've automated those things, and you've taken that work off of the developer plate, you've taken that work off of the coding plate, your success is that you've given them more time to do the functional software. Uh, and granted, that doesn't demo well, uh, but it helps to build a relationship when you come back and say, hey, you know what? We're good. And you don't have to do it as often because we've done one of these things. Uh, and so, As we move forward from that, one of the things I like to talk about is being king for the day, right? Everybody likes to think about what would I do if I was in charge? How would I make things better immediately? What would I immediately fix uh, to make it to the next step? To make sure that we were agilely compliant, that we managed our risk, that we were delivering effective processes uh, for the way. And here, move security processes to the left. And I want to move security processes to the left. And I want to move as much to the left as possible. And I want to move them to the left so that I can integrate software, so that I can make things quicker, so that I can allow humans to do more human things uh, because we're automating more things along the process. And that automation is key in getting those results uh, in being able to uh, flood the, uh, the auditors or the inspectors with the degree of data to which you're doing these things. We talked about being able to do uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery, but part of that is continuous monitoring that everything that comes out of that pipeline delivers an artifact. And every one of those artifacts has potential uh, security value, or not security value, but compliance value. And being able to manage those things to show compliance all the way across the process, and being able to understand what's coming out of your pipeline to show that process, uh, to expedite that security, and onboard the people effectively. Uh, 
the better I can integrate, the better I can move the security to the left, uh, the better process I have at getting the right data in the right place at the right time. I had a story, but it's still going to be so we continue moving that, uh, that that pipeline up and that that's the speeds up in the pipeline uh, to get our, our process in the right place where we need to go. Um, the next we want to be able to move security checks to the right. So both as we say move security to the, the left, we want to move security to the right um, because we want to have a compliance as acceptance criteria, right? We want to have security to the right to the fact that when they're done, they're thinking about it and saying, hey, I, I'm done. Uh, and this is good because it includes security. Uh, it includes security all the way, all the way as the process is being done. Um, how do we get the, the the devs to include that? How do we talk to them enough that they think about security as part of the process? They think when they want to include something, they come to us and say, "Hey, I need to include this, and I want to have security." And that talks about trust, and that talks about people, and that talks about interactions used to hear uh, Ronald Reagan talk back in the 80s, he used to say, trust but verify. Uh, you have to trust but verify. So we trust all our developers, and we trust that they're going to do the right things, and we verify through the tools, and we verify through that knowledge, uh, and we verify through scans. One of the processes we put in is they do all their scans in the pipeline. Uh, and when they've, when they've done their scans, and when they've done their checks, and when it's all done, and it's gone into delivery, and we're ready to pull that into production, uh, the next step is we go back and we run our own scans against it. And we run our own scans in the process as it's sitting in production, waiting for that next pull. Uh, so that it doesn't slow them down. It doesn't stop them. But it, it's a verification mode. We verify that our process is matched up against their process. And you know what? The numbers they got from their tools are the same as the number we, numbers we got from our tools. Uh, and that's how we do things effectively. That's how we do things uh, in the right way so that we make sure that security is doing the right things and security is doing the right processes. And those are integrated processes. Those processes take everybody. Those processes take uh, the right value, build value for the organization, to stick to our goals, to stick to our vision. Uh, one of the personal pet peeves I have is uh, you always talk to people, and people say the meetings are boring. Meetings are boring. I want less meetings. I don't want to. I don't want to talk. All my meetings are boring. Uh, in a, a, a side point, I don't think any meeting is boring. I don't think any meeting where I can go and learn something from the people there, and being able to interact with the people and create value and create a process is born. Uh, if you go into the meetings, if you set an agenda for the meeting, uh, or if the person has an agenda set, uh, then you can get effective things done uh, through those meetings. You can get an effective process, uh, and you can learn about the people, and you can get better interaction. You can get that collaboration you need. You can get that change you need by talking about effective things. And that ties into the other half of security, that no one's issue is ever unnecessary. A lot of people say, well, I don't want to worry about your issue. I don't want to worry about your issue. Just like no meeting is boring, no one's issue is unnecessary. Everybody has a reason they are putting their issue forward, and they have something they need to get done and something that's valuable for them. You need to be able to recognize their value, and you need to be able to prioritize, but you need to be able to address uh, across the entire scope of those factors that there are things that we get done to make things happen in a way that best measures everybody and best helps everyone uh, to move forward. So we try to address everyone's security concerns. We try to address everyone's security concerns along the way. Um, and make sure that we're talking about uh, how those things work and what they have and what they need and what their goals are. Um, one of the biggest pet peeves is people will run in and they will go, hey, we have this, uh, this new CVE just popped up and we have this critical vulnerability on one of the systems we use. And or one of the systems we're planning on using, and it's back behind all these VPN firewalls, but we haven't, we have to patch it right now. So, well, if you want to patch it, you know, we know what the patch is. Do you have any capacity to patch it? They say, no, we can't patch it for three sprints, but it needs to be patched right now. And this is a security problem. So, well, you know, we've kind of already had that discussion. If, if you haven't prioritized it, and you don't want to prioritize it to right now, uh, then it is a security problem. Well, let's talk about it as a security problem. Let's put it on our compliance scent. But, we're not going to fix it for three sprints. And if that's what we work with, you know, that's what we work with as, as we move forward. So we have to address everyone's concerns and we can't be uh, dismissive about it. Uh, 
one of the other frameworks we have in that same type of mindset, uh, one of the things that's happened to me on occasion is our engineer comes up with that same type of question, right? He comes up and says, hey, we've got this great big CVE and we need to fix it. We need to worry about it. Uh, and you know what? Uh, the security guys aren't doing a good enough job. You guys need to be out there threat hunting. You need to be looking at the new malware. You need to be looking at how that stuff is coming at us. You need to be talking about our, the, the, the new threats and the new vulnerabilities and the new processes. Uh, in our conversation back a lot of times, it's, hey, we talked about having these the secure technical implementation guides, right? These basic standards of security that you need to be able to. Uh, and you guys can't get to the basic standards. Um, and if you can't do the basic part that we've been asking for, and I understand that you, you prioritize, we have functions that we need to deliver. Uh, but if the basics can't be done, how do we get to the advanced part uh, to move forward? And that's that deliberate practice again. That's working on those deliberate practices, uh, working on those deliberate practices all through the process uh, so that we can manage our risk on uh, threat exposure and not just vulnerability, not just talk about where it's open, but how do we reduce our exposure? How do we reduce that attack surface that's out there uh, so that we can manage our threat, uh, so we can do our risk operations, so that we can become agilely compliant and uh, we can move along the way. So I know I'm short of, a little bit short of my hour time, but I do have some questions. Uh, so this is me. This was Agile Compliance and Risk Operations. There's some of my contact information. Uh, I'll go back and I think I've got questions in a, a reverse order as we look at them. So the first one is any framework recommendations for standing up an information security uh, assurance program? Uh, obviously there's good things for InfoSec all along the way. Uh, being a government guy, being a lot of time in government, uh, Let's just move the window and create a crisis from the fair application. There we go. This should be all clear now. But it says recommendations. I, I, I like NIST uh, because I've been in the government. It's kind of overdone, but at least it gives you a good frame. It gives you some good discussions for how you stand up and how you think about uh, what the risk is and what the vulnerability is. Uh, being an Intel guy, I look at vulnerability as well, and I start with some of those vulnerability questions. Uh, and you start with things about um, how do I know? Uh, once you know, how do you uh, how do you prove that if that's true, or what do you see next? And if you see something next, uh, the next step is what are the assumptions that you need to make that true? Uh, so NIST 853, as I mentioned earlier, is a great one uh, for standing up that initial uh, information security assurance program. Uh, I'm sure if you look out there, there's a lot of different things. SANS Institute has a lot of good stuff about how to stand up an information uh, security program. Uh, and work through. So I work back through questions. Uh, working security I found tools that assist you in the process. Uh, there are all kinds of tools that will help us automate. Uh, Sonotype is a great one that will do things. Uh, we have been working with Salt uh, to get a demo uh, extensively because Salt will do a lot of the automation for the infrastructure, um, and we'll find ways that can. Uh, automate the infrastructure, but not just automate the infrastructure, but automate the configuration management to do some of those tedious processes of keeping track of versions, uh, keeping track of updates through versions, keeping track of um, the compliance and the policy associated. Uh, and, and not only that, but we've talked with some of the, the users of SALT who've been fairly happy with it, uh, and they can put it in and it will institute a baseline configuration on their system and track and return everything to that baseline configuration. Um, and once it does, if they had a custom configuration, they can move it back and change it back to what they had as that custom setup. Uh, and then you just manage it through that type of process. Um, the Yeah, the tedious security checklists are long. I mentioned NIST 853, there's 19 families, there's over a thousand controls. Uh, some of it is just being able to talk and having your folks be comfortable with you that, hey, you know what, you really don't have to answer all those questions. Or in looking at those questions and you being familiar with those questions, you can talk to the security folks about how do you automate the tools in the pipeline that give you artifacts uh, that answer those tools for you so you can just pump those, those answers into those checklists uh, as you move forward. Uh, quantifiable details in the federal cyberspace, some of the KPIs related to compliance risk management. Uh, communicating the effectiveness of scaling Agile over water. Well, so one of the biggest difficulties in the government space that we see is that the government wants to be waterfall. Uh, they have a large bureaucratic process, and they want to be agile when they say, hey, uh, we want you to be agile. We want you to do this DevOps thing. 
And that means you're going to deliver our, uh, our new software, our new functional software that we're really excited about. And you're going to deliver it in three months, right? He says, sure, great. Give me a, a full DevOps way to go. Uh, we'll deliver your software in, in three months. You give us all the resources, we're good. I say, well, that's great. Here's all the resources. Uh, but by the way, here's all these paperwork standards that you need to meet while you're doing the resources. Here's all these bureaucratic things that need to be answered uh, while you go forward. So we go into Agile. Uh, we go into this process for our, for our own program. And they say, hey, we need you to be Agile. Uh, we need you to start delivering. We need you to start delivering good stuff. But one of those first things we need to prove that you're Agile is we need a 150-page uh, system engineering management plan that describes exactly how you're Agile in every phase of the process uh, before you get a process up and running. Um, so that is, is difficult when you manage it. Uh, obviously, the, the KPI, the key performance indicator uh, to compliance and risk management, um, is just that we're doing it, uh, that you're making process, that you're getting there, uh, that you're getting things like scans done, that you're getting things like uh, integration done. Uh, I mentioned we took over from a previous company. The previous company had the contract for about three years. In that three years, they had not delivered a, uh, a single release. Uh, not one. They were still working on the same version they had when they had picked it up three years previously. In the nine months our company has had the contract, uh, we delivered our first release, um, our first update. They're not major releases, right? Minor releases is what they're calling them. Uh, about three months in, six months after that, we delivered our second release, about five months, uh, and we're on our way to delivering our third release uh, here in the next month and a half. Um, so while we gripe about all the small things that we have and all the problems we still have, uh, the fact is that it has turned into functional software. And in addition to that functional software, uh, with the compliance, uh, we went into the process where we have scans in the pipeline. Uh, previous was doing development work, but they weren't doing a pipeline. They weren't doing any type of CICD pipeline. They weren't type of doing any type of management. Now, every time the code gets checked in, it does a full uh, code check. It does that full sonar queue with that, that static analysis. And then we use uh, Tenable's uh, ACAST framework to do scans on the overall integration to making sure that it's compliant with STIGs and CVEs uh, at the far end. Uh, and those scans come every time uh, code is checked in and then built on a nightly basis. Uh, and then we do those scans on a monthly basis to go back and check that what we're building uh, actually matches or the, the scans we're getting from the pipeline actually match the scans we've got to the build. So those are some of the KPIs we use. Uh, move forward. At the FAIR risk management, I don't think I've seen the FAIR risk management framework. Um, I will uh, look it up and take a look. If you want to uh, give me an email, I'm happy to give you a response back. Uh, I've seen a lot of stuff and a lot of risk management boils down to that, that same, uh, for me, that, that threat versus vulnerability versus exposure. Um, and there's a lot of things we can do along the way to get there, and a lot of things we can look at to manage those individual risks. Uh, but when we, we look at the risks, um, we still have to manage them effectively. We have to manage them effectively uh, based on our organization. Uh, as a DevOps ambassador, I have to say it manages value, right? How do you deliver value for your organization? How do you get security to a place where you deliver effective value uh, in moving forward? So how do we approach organizations where senior leadership is focused on delivering Agile with no regard to how their organization is currently structured for delivering software? How do you approach these conversations? Uh, well, when the senior leadership is your boss, obviously you, you uh, approach them very carefully. Um, and that has to be the key. Uh, and I think it goes back to being the advocate and, and saying the same things over and over. Uh, part of that Agile is that transparency. Uh, and you need to be able to approach them and say, hey, look, uh, you know what, this isn't working. Uh, and when they're not willing to change, then you kind of do the best you can sometimes. Uh, or you offer different suggestions. I've had a lot of good luck with bosses in the past when instead of saying, hey, we need to change this, we need a, a plan from you or I need an approach from you, is to suggest, uh, you know what, here's what I think, here's how I think we should do it. Uh, what do you think about that? Can you give me some, some, some input on the changes? I'm making process that way. If you can't, Agile should not be as 
defined by the organization structure is by the cultural mindset. Uh, if you're talking about how you hand off information from one to the other, uh, Agile is a, a process of reducing the number of handoffs that you have, or the DevOps is a process of reducing the number of uh, process that you have. Uh, maybe one of the suggestions would be if you look at a the, the SRE programs or site reliability engineer to streamline some of those things. Uh, maybe implementing or um, in, enforcing a site reliability engineer could help you get the champion uh, to make the changes where you needed to make the changes. Uh, I talked to her at a speech last year at DevSecOps up in Austin. Um, one of the individuals talked about having a Batman, having a Batman on their SOC team. And every time the guy came in, it was Batman. You called from the outside to get somebody, you got back. Whoever was there for that week was Batman, right? Uh, and it's the same type of thing with SRE that you have an individual whose job is to make things flow better. Um, and that they do the restructuring, and they present the restructuring, and they make sure that things flow through, or they just take it and they walk it from place to place to make sure that the things get done uh, in the way they need to get done. And, and I think as you increase the value, you've gradually convinced the senior leadership that the agile thing is better, and that you're increasing their value when they give you some space to do these type of things. Uh, as I mentioned with government, uh, one of those challenges is um, when they implement DevOps for the first time, and I've been in the two different organizations, so I've seen it twice. Uh, the first thing they really need to do is they need to say, all right, you're gonna be agile, we're gonna do this thing, and we're gonna do this flow with DevOps, but here's your first three months, plan your sprints, but I don't need anything delivered, right? I have no expectations other than that you build your teams, you do the bottom-up organization, you figure out how your teams are gonna work, and you figure out how the process is gonna uh, unfortunately, a lot of organizations don't have time for that, uh, but it does speak to the effectiveness of creating your own dojo where you can focus on those things, where you can bring the people out for a while or bring a team out and have them focus on a very specific thing, which is training uh, and learning how they should interact and learning how they need to interact with other folks. Uh, so I mean, until afterwards, we uh, I don't think I have any more questions. We'll move things over to the the, uh, the other track. Uh, we'll move it over to track two. If somebody has any more questions for me, I'll be happy to take them there. I'll be hanging out. Thanks again to B-Sides for giving me the opportunity. I really enjoyed the chance to speak. Uh, hopefully, you all enjoyed it as well. Um, and I will return it to the uh, the presenter so that he can have control and he can let the next person get set up for their presentation. Thank you very awesome. much. I appreciate your time.